Nancy, uh, well, actually Dr. Nancy McCarthy Snyder. Just a couple of comments, and then on the back of your agenda, there's a bigger bio. She's been very busy in her last 40 years of her life. <laughs> she is Professor Emeritus of Public Administration at Wichita State University, where she was a member of the faculty for almost 40 years. The final six years as director of the Hugo Wall School of Public Affairs. She holds master's and doctorate degrees in economics. And from 2010 to 2016, she was a member of the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group for the Kansas budget. So if you ever wonder where those numbers come from, the projections for revenue, it comes from this group. And she served for six years helping build those projections. So let's um, go ahead and uh, give her a great round of applause and we'll get started here. Um, thank you for having me. It's so nice to come down here and see the, the good, moderate, progressive women of Cowley County. It's very nice. Um, and it's interesting, if I had made this presentation a week ago, it would sound different than it sounds today. Those revenue estimators met last Friday and they changed their estimates. So we're going to talk about that. Um, but the first thing I want to do is to put things in some context. So where were we before the pandemic? I mean, the goal today is to talk about what impact the pandemic has had on the Kansas budget. And um, so we need to know what would things look like before the pandemic. And they looked really pretty good. In February, there's some, you know, we can argue about when the pandemic, the pandemic mm -hmm. really started. President clearly knew about it in January. The first cases in the U.S. happened in January, but things really began to change. Public awareness, economic impact, shutdowns in communities really happened around March. I've got a good friend who keeps a daily tab. She says like day 283, we had a hmm. Zoom get together. I've, I've been doing these happy hours on Zoom with my friends. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Drink wine and talk and laugh. And she said, I said, it's day 200 Can you something. sign me up, please? <laughs> <laughs> me too. Start your own. Okay. The last time I tried, I still had children. Okay, well, you know what? We don't really use Zoom. There's an app called, this is completely off the topic. How do we should be recording? Called Happy Hour, which is what my sisters got me started on. It's super easy to use. It's free. And it works just like Zoom, except they've got games you can play and do more fun stuff. So that's what we use. It's called Happy, Happy Hour. Hour. It's got a good title. <laughs> and that's, see, that's right. So that's what gives us permission to drink wine. <laughs> but March the 13th, it was a Friday the 13th, just mm -hmm. like yesterday oh, was a Friday the 13th. Yes, it was. Is the day when the NCAA announced oh. that they weren't going to have the tournament, which is kind of the tipping point that we knew mm -hmm. things were very serious and what happened. So March is what we're going to talk about as the... Uh, the starting point. And at that time, the unemployment rate in the United States was 3.5%. That's the 50-year low. It's really a good um, indicator. And in February, the same time, Kansas's unemployment rate was 3.1%. Um, as we move forward, a couple of things to keep in mind. I mean, if you were all here when I was here last July in my little intro lecture on the <laughs> Kansas budget. but. Um, when we talk about the Kansas budget, we make a couple of distinctions. And the first one is between the state general fund and all funds. Um, the state general fund is the budget that gets the most attention by far in the legislature. And that's because it's the fund that receives almost all of the sales tax and the income tax. So that money is going in there and that's what the legislators care about and think about. And frankly, the governor as well. And the, um, so the, the other distinction I want to talk about is that when we talk about revenue to the state general fund, we have two numbers. One is total taxes that are expected to come in. And then there's another one that's called total revenue. And the difference between those two is that when we get to total taxes, then there are a few things that have to be added and subtracted. We had interest that the reserve funds can take in. We add, um, there's some fees that some of the agencies charge and can take in. And then we subtract out some transfers. There are things the state law says from the state general fund 
has to be transferred to the state highway fund. Now that's fine, except in the last uh, seven years, <laughs> the tra highway fund's been transferring the money right back to the state general fund rather than spending it on highways. Yeah. But, um, and a few other transfers to a capital fund and to some education stuff. Total revenue available is almost always less than total taxes. And I confess throughout this presentation, since I was one of the revenue estimators and focused on the tax side, I'm a little inconsistent in when I talk about total taxes or total revenue, but it's labeled, so I hope that doesn't confuse anybody. Um, we ended fiscal year 2019, the first year that Laura Kelly was governor, with a surplus of one billion dollars. Now that is extraordinary because mm -hmm. the state had only before that mm -hmm. since 2003 to 2018 had only one year 2013 when there was actually they met the full ending balances required by state law. State law says they have to budget and actually spend to keep seven and a half percent of the state general fund budget to carry over because if they ended the year zero, and actually the Kansas Policy Institute is currently doing a lot of research to try to say that school districts got way too much in balances and they shouldn't be spending them. But if they end zero at the end of the fiscal year, guess what? Mm -hmm. July paychecks are gonna bounce. Mm -hmm. For straight, sound fiscal management, you need some carryover. And Kansas didn't have a rainy day fund, so that ending balance was what was there to spend if we had a tornado that ripped through and did tons of damage and needed corrected or recession dropped revenues whatever reason um, it was a good thing to have and 2019 was amazing that we ended with 1.1 billion dollars so the total annual projected taxes for fiscal year 2020 then the one that ended last july or this just three months ago four months ago was 7.7 .7 billion and the projected total revenue, remember I told you that difference between taxes and revenue, was 7.652. So by law, the budget for fiscal year 20 had to be built with spending of no more than 7.652. Except that, um, the, and that's the revenue side. This is the revenue, this, this is the revenue side. And, um, but for spending, they actually passed a budget that had spending of 7.75 billion um, for the state general fund and total expenditures for all the other stuff of 18.41 billion dollars. Wow. And they budgeted to end the year with surpluses, balances of 552 million dollars. Mm -hmm. okay. Now why could they spend more than they took in in revenue? It's because of that billion dollar carryover. Yes, they had because they could money spend to start with. Yes, yeah, they had more money. That was available total available resources includes <clears throat> yeah, what you start the prior year carryover plus what you're taking in in new revenue. Mm -hmm. um, any, if anybody, anytime, stop me. Comments, questions, we're a small group. We can stay pretty informal. Okay. So back to our context. When we start right before the um, the budget situation, right before the pandemic. Uh, tax revenue was actually coming in ahead of estimates. It was 3.8% above what the consensus revenue estimators had met. Now, the consensus revenue estimators meet twice a year. They meet in April, right after April 15th. Frankly, not far enough after April 15th to get a really accurate picture because people mail things on the 15th, but they aren't always in and counted by then. Mm -hmm. um, and then they meet again in November, somewhere around election time. So then they had, estimates had been made in November of 2019 for fiscal year 20, and again, we were 3.8% above the November forecast when they did the April, well, in February. The total revenue was 4.1% above estimated, and, the, and, in, and when we talk about the state general fund, about 90% of the revenue in the state general fund is from income taxes and sales taxes. Those are the two really big sources. And the income tax at that time was 4.4% above projections, which had been increased from the prior April. And um, sales taxes, well, all excise taxes, that's almost all sales and use, were 2.29% above projections. Um, and it, although it doesn't go into the uh, 
state general fund. The motor fuels tax is an important source of revenue for our highways. So I've looked that up and also, and again, um, there, there's no consensus estimate for motor fuels taxes, but I just looked and motor fuels taxes were 2.9% ahead in February of calendar year 20 as they had been in February of 2019. So things were going up and things worked. So bottom line, the context, economy is doing pretty well, mm -hmm. revenues coming in, budget stable, the governor is making significant progress toward cleaning up the financial mess that she inherited, and it still really is. There still wasn't a structural balance in the budget, which means that expenditures were greater mm -hmm. than new revenue coming in. But she was trying to get rid of some debt, because mm -hmm. debt had increased dramatically. Oh, yeah. She was trying to eliminate the um, transfers from the highway fund into the state general fund, and was making real progress. Okay, so what happened? March, <laughs> COVID, um, kind of radically changed things. Um, in the first quarter, January, February, March, so it includes a little bit of the pandemic, gross national product in the United States dropped 5%. In the second quarter, April through June, the gross domestic product declined 31.4%. That is astonishing. That's more than GDP ever dropped during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Okay. It's huge, but it only lasted a, a quarter. Then the following quarter, which we got reports of just a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. we recovered and the GDP grew 33.1%. But remember, it grew 33 from 1% from a point that was 30% lower mm -hmm. than it had been. So overall, by October, U.S. economy had regained about two-thirds of what it lost in April through June. Mm -hmm. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, losses were focused in the service sector of the economy, anything to do with travel, recreation, restaurants, hotels, but also manufacturing. Um, and here we can see kind of what really things look like in terms of unemployment and unemployment rates. Again, February, U.S. 33.5, a 50-year low, Kansas 3.1. Kansas actually lowered its unemployment rate mm -hmm. in April, down to 2.8. But again, peaks in April, 14.7% nationally unemployment rate. 11.9% in Kansas, and consistently unemployment has dropped mm -hmm. since that point. Um, state unemployment numbers are, are, are a month behind national, so I don't have the Kansas October rate, but um, in September, Kansas's rate was 5.9%. But just to give you a sense of variation, the unemployment rate in Sedgwick County is 9.1% still mm -hmm. oh, wow. in, in September. That's because there's so many layoffs in the manufacturing mm -hmm. plants and, and the restaurants. And um, it's yeah. a really very, very unhealthy situation still. Yeah. And what's more, um, uh, these numbers don't reflect changes in what we call the labor force participation rate. In order to be counted as unemployed, you have to be looking for a job. And if you're not mm -hmm. looking for a job, you're not considered in the, mm -hmm. the labor force is the base for the, those fractions. That's because um, and what we know is that large numbers of people have dropped out of the labor force because they just couldn't handle it, particularly young mothers who needed to be worried about their kids and how their kids were going, getting through school. Mm -hmm. They just decided, I have to choose, and I'm going to choose making sure my kids are taken care of. And so we know that there have been a lot of dropouts in the labor force participation, labor force as well. Any questions about? This is from the Department of Bureau of Labor Statistics at the U.S. and Ooh, oh my God, what did I do? Roll Lawrence, what did I do? I hit, I think I hit sure. one of these buttons instead of my forward button. No <laughs> problem, we can fix that. That's all right, that's just what I do. Yes. So I need to keep my fingers off. He'll, he'll get you going. He'll, yeah, he'll get you fast. <laughs> So anyway, the situation right now is in the United States as a whole, that we originally lost about 22 million jobs. There are still 11 million unemployed people, not counting the people who Lawrence, dropped out of the labor force. That's the last one. Okay, okay. That's what, I, I can, can, I can back, yeah. go back here then. Okay, she'll go back, okay. There we go. Okay. That's where it was. There I think I just hit this button instead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, there's still about 11 million, oh, here. Well, this is interesting, just contrast. Um, 
Between March and May of 2020, this year, the U.S. lost about 22 million jobs to get up to that unemployment rate of 14.7 mm -hmm. and down. That compares to the Great Recession of 2010 and 2008 to 2010, remember how bad that was, mm -hmm. and long and extended, where the unemployment rate peaked at 9.8%, never got above 10% as opposed to what it was mm -hmm. this spring. And, um, in, and at that time, the total loss during that time was only about 8.7 million jobs. Mm -hmm. This loss is 22 million. Ooh. So it's a much Three much times. worse three times. situation. Yeah, three times. Kansas lost about 111,000 jobs during that same period compared to 39,500 in the 2008-2010 wow. recession. It wasn't the population lower, or this is percentage, so is that her? Yeah, no, per no, yeah, it is a percent, yeah. Well, these are, these are numbers as no, jobs. No, numbers. Yeah. 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 So the population would have been... So, so a little bit. It's a 10-year growth, so it's not like we had a huge change yeah. in population mm -hmm. over there. But you're right, in terms of numbers. That's one of, you, you hit a pet peeve of mine, which is when they report COVID numbers, mm -hmm. and they keep talking about worst cases are California and New York and Illinois, and I go, that's where there's more people. You know, and when they report by just sure. total number of cases, you can you see, and then the map is where the red, you know, that's where the people are. It's a kind of a, mm -hmm. it yeah, doesn't tell you much. You need, you need some relative so, infection rates. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, where were we? So, it, yeah, because we only lost 39,000 jobs in the recession, that's and our unemployment change. peaked mm -hmm. in August of 2009 at 7.3%. We recovered faster than the U.S. The, it didn't peak till November of 2010. Unemployment falls technically formally. I don't know if you care about this. <laughs> the recession started in 2007 and ended in 2009. is defined by the economists of reductions in gross domestic product. But re unemployment mm -hmm. follows. It lags mm -hmm. when the actual... GDP started to increase. But wasn't so, this to be expected when you have a shutdown? Exactly. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, no. You, you can't have both. Well, exactly, and that's kind of where we're going with this. Yeah. Um, so where we are now, um, again, we have recovered U.S. level, about half of the jobs that were lost in Kansas, um, probably not that much. We've still got about 90,000 Kansans mm -hmm. who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's more, the, the longer the recession lasts, the longer mm -hmm. this happens, the more harm it does to workers, the harder it is to become employed again, because mm -hmm. you lose skills, your resume doesn't look as good. And what we're finding now, after nine months of this, is that um, the people who remain unemployed are more likely to be permanently unemployed as opposed to, we gained back half the jobs in you know six months because there was a lot of temporary job loss due to that initial shutdown where you had all those losses, and now as restaurants start opening up and people start traveling a little more, airlines was another big, big hit. Mm -hmm. um, we are now seeing the people that are unemployed are more likely to be permanently unemployed. From the, the, the jobs that they had are not going to be available anymore, and they're probably not going to go back. But we don't count them, right? No, well, if they're still looking for jobs, we do. Yeah. Okay. It's have to but be. if you're so hopeless that you don't go out looking anymore. That's right. You're then just they don't count. Out. You're underground. Yeah. You're, right. you're yeah. under the radar. Exactly. That's exactly right. So um, as of September, about 12 million U.S. citizens were still unemployed and 8 .8, 88,000 Kansans. And I'm sure there were some people that retired early just because... Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a very good mm -hmm. observation. I think that's exactly yeah. right. And in fact, I mean, Wichita State where mm -hmm. I worked for 40 years, offered an early retirement program. Mm -hmm. Only about 16 people actually ended up, they just announced yes. yesterday, mm -hmm. actually took it, which isn't going to, and they're paying a, a year's pay, so I'm not sure it's safe for the university. It wasn't a very well-planned or designed. Uh, well, it's just, it was just said, right. didn't leave time for a lot of planning. No, then that's a, that's a really, that's one of the other things, that this happened so suddenly. Mm -hmm that it's really hard um, to plan well and to be smart. In addition, it's so unprecedented that we're sort of flying blind. We don't know mm -hmm. what's going to work and what sure. isn't going to work. So it's hard to be overly critical of anybody for mm -hmm. a misstep that may or may not have been taken to address these issues. Yeah, you have to just do something and see how well it goes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do we Trump get... Trump can't be blamed. 
totally, but then he, he was inept and wasn't capable yes. of stepping yes. in and doing what he could. Yeah, and not, you know, listening to other people yeah. who had some experience. Who had knowledge. Some yeah. yeah. So, where we get, we started with the baseline. We got COVID, and we know that there have been thousands of cases and thousands of deaths. We know how COVID now affects the economy and employment. And from that, we have to go to the state budget. Mm -hmm. So the connection. And the relationship between the health of the state economy and the amount of revenue collected um, is uh, pretty straightforward. Because, as I mentioned, 90% of our state general fund revenue comes from a combination of the income tax, the corporate income tax, and a separate franchise tax, which is just really a corporate tax for banks. Um, and sales tax. And the sales tax, I, I always add in the compensating use tax. Mm -hmm. Compensating use tax exists because sales taxes by law are levied at the point of purchase. So it's where you actually buy something that you owe the sales tax. Um, and um, it gets real complicated when you try to collect it. I mean, People from outside Kansas who pay sales tax in Kansas aren't supposed to have to pay sales tax in Kansas. Instead, what they're supposed to do is pay a use tax in Oklahoma where they actually live. And the same thing's true here. If, and particularly now, as we buy things online, mm -hmm. we don't owe sales tax to Kansas, but because we live here, we actually do owe Kansas. And consequently, we have what we call the use tax, which is a substitute for, you know, you buy something in Missouri you don't have to pay Missouri, but you do owe Kansas. And it's the exact same amount as the sales tax. And what's interesting, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. That's the one revenue source that's been growing like crazy. Yeah, right. Because people are <laughs> buying, because Amazon and Jeff Bezos are getting very rich. Yes. We're paying taxes to, cap, uh, to Kansas on stuff that people have bought online. So sales tax is going up, but most of the revenue is income related. So think about it. Income tax, mm -hmm. corporate income taxes, and sales tax on stuff we buy is the main source. So there's, there, is, there have been studies and there is a quantitative relationship between tax receipts and state domestic product. And that is called the income elasticity hmm. of taxes. I mean, econ, I know you took an econ class and studied about price elasticity. It says that if a price goes up, people buy less. And how responsive, how much we buy, to a price increase is called price elasticity. Well, this income elasticity means as income changes, income goes up, in personal, and spending may go up. If income goes down, spending will go down. And how much is called the income elasticity of spending? Well, there's also elasticity of tax revenue. As income goes up, revenue comes in at a certain quantitative rate, and that's what we call the income elasticity. So if if the income elasticity was one, a 10% increase in uh, the economy and gross domestic product should bring in 10% more tax revenue. If income state domestic product goes down 5%, we would expect revenue to go down 5% if the elasticity was one. If it's more than one, there's a more robust response if it's less smaller. Um, you probably didn't want to get all into it. My, my econ class, sometimes I revert to my old ways. Um, so again, 90% comes that. So in general, when state domestic product increases, so does tax revenue. And when it goes down, so does revenue. And we know that the, income, the economy was crashing. Unemployment was high. We've got national GDP numbers. I don't have state domestic product numbers, but we know it was declining significantly from March through May. Uh, so the consensus revenue estimators met in April, which is what they have to do, which the recession or the pandemic as we knew it was about a month old. And they issued new estimates. And they, a week before they actually do the estimates, they meet and do an economic consensus to make some assumptions on what they think the economy is going to do. I'm just curious, who's on that group that does that? Are they um, bipartisan or are they? It's professionals. Oh. It's okay. the people, it's the staff of the Kansas Department of Revenue, okay. it's staff of the Legislative Research Division, and it's staff of the State Budget okay. Department, all of which are pretty nonpartisan. The governor, the budget director is partisan, but the staff okay. is not. And three academic economists, one from KU, one from K-State, and one from Wichita State. So that's what I did for six years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very, 
the e academics are there basically to maintain some integrity in the process to keep it from being political. You got three tenured faculty members who aren't beholden to pretty much anybody. Mm -hmm. They don't have any stake in. And what happens in a lot of states, this consensus process in Kansas has been very highly touted. It's been very accurate. It's been not political. There are some states where they spend half of their legislative session mm -hmm. arguing over the revenue estimates that they have because states all have to balance their budget. Mm -hmm. And so if we're overly optimistic <laughs> about revenue, mm -hmm. then you have less difficult decisions to make about any cuts that might have to be made. You know, in some states you don't have to actually balance the budget. You just have to propose and pass a budget that shows some balance. Um, so it can get politicized. In Kansas, it's in a very, very well administered program. And, and not political, exactly kind of, I think, what you're trying to get at. Um, so the assumptions they used was that GDP would decrease 4.5% in cal. And we use calendar year assumptions, because that's mm -hmm. how the federal government measures most of these things. 4.5% um, mm -hmm. in calendar year 2020. We're on track for it to be much higher than that, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, not, not, we're, you know, we're down to being much better than we were, but it's still going to be more. Um, and, and, and they always do it for two years out. So oh, yeah. they were in, they were about to wrap up fiscal year 2020 in April. So there were only two months left of fiscal year 2020 when they made these estimates in late April. Um, but they also then laid out estimates for fiscal year 21, which is the budget the legislature was working on in April. And they estimated an increase in GDP, so a recovery from the recession of about 1.6% in GDP for calendar year 2021. Uh, corporate profits were expected to decrease in about 11% 11, 11 and increase only 6 tenths of 1% in the next year. Um, the Kansas, well, corporate profits also, I think I just said that. Real Kansas gross state product was expected to decrease 4.7% in this current year we're in, and then increase 1.8% next year. So that's a very slow economic recovery. Um, and the unemployment rate would be 6.4% in 2020 and 5.9% in 21. Um, so those are the assumptions that went into new estimates then that said that um, Total tax receipts would decline 10.6% from the estimates that had been made in November. Remember, there were a whole set of estimates for all the taxes mm -hmm. in November of 19, okay, which was in fiscal year 2020. Right. Then they estimated again with just two months left what the total tax revenue was going to be for fiscal year 2020 when they met in April. And then they made further estimates for the following fiscal year which is July through June of 21. And I'm sorry, I know this may be really boring. It's just numbers after numbers, but it's kind of <laughs> the situation that we're in, which we'll, I'm trying to make progress into kind of what the actual implications of all of this are going to be for us. Um, so the 20, FY20 projections for total tax receipts will reduce 10.6% from the November 19 estimate, which is the basis for the budget and how the budget had actually been built and how the spending estimates had been calculated. And that's a reduction of $815.6 million wow. <laughs> in, for the current fiscal year that we were in. Um, in. And of that 815, they estimated that about 646 million of it was because one of the things that they passed was to delay income tax do when the income taxes were due from its traditional April 15th mm -hmm. to July 15th, which means they expected a significant amount of revenue that was actually owed was going to actually come in in July of 2020, which is in fiscal year it's the next 21. fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big That's drop. A big, yeah. um, <laughs> That, that yeah. makes a big difference. I mean, and the idea was to help people who were in yeah. trouble or unemployed and, and sure. were just so sure. swamped. They weren't, you know, let's see, hit in March. People weren't getting their taxes done because sure. just too much other stuff was going on. Uh, for fiscal year 21, total tax estimates declined 6.9%, mm -hmm. um, which is a 
$1.4 million, which is cumulative over what they thought was going to happen in uh, FY20. Wow. Actually, however, that didn't happen. Things were not as bad as they anticipated. Actual tax collections in April, May, and June came in above those newly, this is, keep slipping down over my nose, this is crazy. Um, You'll uh, have to tighten up your yeah, little loops, I, I think. Yeah. 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 I have to tie a little knots in mine. <laughs> yeah, tie the knots, yeah. Um, they actually came in significantly above. And in fact, in, in June, the last month of the fiscal year, they were 22% ahead of the estimate. That's great. Now, one, one thing to point out, and I don't know matters again, is that um, the consensus revenue estimators estimate annual mm -hmm. taxes. They don't do these monthly allocations. Then the Department of Revenue, based on historical tax collections, um, break it down monthly. Because we know that there's not a smooth 1 12th is collected every month. Right. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. Things happen at Christmas time, people spend more money, so there's more sales tax. And it, but, so, but based that. on those estimates, 22% mm -hmm. higher income in June than they were That's really crazy. expecting. Mm -hmm. So we ended. Um, Fiscal year 20, um, with revenues 2.4% um, above the actual estimates. And I remember those estimates were low, yeah. but we, we came in better than we thought we would. Um, That's good. The compensating use tax, the one I mentioned to you, has shown significant growth, and that stayed above. Um, but the, and the motor fuels tax, though, was 17% uh, for the total fiscal year 20 below what the 19 mm -hmm. levels in it. So people weren't traveling and they weren't, they weren't traveling. buying gas and there were fewer trucks mm -hmm. driving through and so we got less sales, uh, motor fuels tax. Because the state had begun fiscal year 2020 with a billion dollar reserve, mm -hmm. we didn't have to do any real cuts mm -hmm. in last fiscal year that ended in, in June 30th. We had done, right. then, now the governor did do some amendments, but for the most part, we were able to cover all of that without any great problems. Um, nevertheless, yeah, with that extra billion dollars, <laughs> we ended fiscal year 2020 with only about 90, less than $90 million in carryover. So mm -hmm. there's no cushion so we're really for FY21. Yeah. And guess what the legislature did? We're pretty flat on they, that. Um, had an abbreviated session. You know, they, they always meet from January till May, and the virus hit, and so they kind of adjourned and oh, yeah, were kind of doing Zoom loose. stuff. Mm -hmm. They passed a budget before they stopped. And they passed a budget of um, $8.4 billion, even though the revenue estimate was well below that. They passed the budget with $694 million hole. <laughs> okay. And so the question becomes, what happens? So they leave town in May, and the governor's like, okay, what do we do? That's, that's what you get for leaving this stuff up to men. <laughs> <laughs> Women would not do that, let me well, assure you. Yeah, we are a few Close your Susan, ears, Susan, Susan Michael was still in charge of the Senate, so uh, we do have a few. Uh, <laughs> the state law gives the governor authority when it looks like revenue is insufficient to cover budgeted expenditures to make what they call allotments. And she went in right on the end of June, like June 25th, sent a memo to all of the Secretary of, Re of Administration actually, sent a memo to all the department heads and said, we have determined that we have to impose this law and we're going to make allotments. And I'm going to pass, I didn't bring copies and I didn't make copies, but I'm going to pass these out. and they're. They're two, they're the same. So they're, they're just me measured a little differently. So you can pass them around. These, so she made allotments. Um, you can cut that much. They're about the same. Uh, that she can cut budgets. And she doesn't have to do them across the board. And she gets, the, and departments can appeal an allotment a cut. But the governor ultimately has the final say. And what she did was make cuts of $374 million out of this $690 million. So she covered about half of the total whole with um, these allotments. And what I'm passing around is a little detail 
on what the allotments were. Um, they were uh, heavily focused on, um, she reduced caseloads, she delayed a bunch of payments. I remember when I was here last July, I talked about the pooled money investment board and mm -hmm. how Brownback's administration had kept borrowing money from that till it was oh, down to zero. Right. And then scheduled repayment about $52 million a year. Um, she, and she did, she made the first year payment um, and tried to get the legislature to approve paying off the whole thing with that billion dollars that was yeah. in surplus at the end of the FY19, and the legislature wouldn't let her do it. Because they thought that would give her too much money to be able to pay for Medicaid expansion the following mm -hmm. year, and they didn't want that to happen. Um, so she um, covered about half, and um, delay, but, but one of the things that she did was to delay repayment, with the payments to the pooled money investment board, and put that off. She delayed, talked about delayed payment um, of some of the school mm -hmm. finance stuff, put that off a year. A lot of stuff that she, she physically said she didn't want to do because mm -hmm. she's she's a real budget hawk mm -hmm. who's trying to straighten out finances and this right. really put a damper in that. But, but it, it's an impossible situation. Well, it is. And it's got, it, well, and the really? court has basically told the state they have to protect K-12 education. Mm -hmm. And they just got that fixed last they just year. Finished that. So, yes. but K through 12 education is about 60% mm -hmm. of, of the, the state budget. general fund, and it all comes out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. So, what that means is the only other places to cut are prisons, which mm -hmm. have already been cut mm -hmm. tremendously, mm -hmm. healthcare, Medicaid specifically, when we're trying to um, get more people, and when more people are losing their jobs yes. and needing. Medicaid, mm -hmm. and and they the one of the big chunks that she made was in what they call caseload adjustments, which means there is a consensus revenue estimating group that does the state general fund taxes, which is what I've been talking about, and was the committee that I was on. But there are also other estimating groups that estimate um, uh, caseloads for public assistance and Medicaid because they have to budget to cover mm -hmm. all the people that qualify for that, and they just went in and kind of based on some had to be fairly reasonable estimates, cut what they think the caseloads were going to be, which a lot of cuts in budgeted expenditures. So that's what's coming around is detail from the adjutant general to WSU to KU and K-State took huge cuts. Mm -hmm. um, WSU, uh, we're on a couple million of that 374. But she came up with 374 million in, uh, mm -hmm. in cuts. Um, we're talking about... Uh, I'm going to hand myself or behind myself. Hold on. Okay. I skipped one. Uh, I didn't talk about why revenue was actually coming in pretty well. No, that's federal aid. Hold on. Okay, we got all that. Okay, there's the government. Oh, no, that's federal aid. Okay. I think I skipped it. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, federal aid, before we had to deal with some of this stuff, a lot of federal aid came through. Kansas was allocated 1.25 billion dollars. Of that, 116 million went to Johnson County and 99.6 went to Cedric County. Because the law said counties with more than 500,000 got their money directly and everything else has to go through the state. Um, Cowley County, um, yes, I wish Taggart could have been here. Taggart Wall was my student and he wasn't going to come today, but he said he wasn't feeling 100% and he didn't want to take any chances. But um, So we, we got 7.2 7, 7, million. Yeah, um, and I've got with cool. me uh, some of the detail of where that money went. Mm -hmm. A lot of it to hospitals, a lot of it to school districts, mm -hmm. but here's the kick. None of that money can be used to replace lost revenue mm -hmm. because in, in local governments, and we haven't even talked about this for the impact on property taxes. One of the things for local governments is dependence on the property tax. And the property mm -hmm. tax yeah. is very inelastic, mm -hmm. which means if the economy goes down, property change. taxes don't change. Right. If the economy goes up, property taxes don't change very much. So they're protected in that sense from big recessions or yeah. expansions. <laughs> Well, yeah, except if you're unemployed and have to pay property taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have no um, money. <laughs> but yeah. increasingly, increasingly, any county that's got any major urban 
that has been dependent, more increasingly dependent on the sales tax. Mm -hmm. And the sales tax has That's been declining. Yeah. And, and here's one of our interesting dilemmas and trade-offs. We all know and have recognized that it's a problem that the Kansas sales tax is levied on food. Mm -hmm. okay, we're one of only two states that put our full mm -hmm. sales tax rate on food. When the economy goes in the toilet, when local governments have demands for their services and in decreasing revenue, the fact that that tax is on food, when people are unemployed and hurt, they put food on the table before they spend any other money, which means that the sales tax is less elastic mm -hmm. than other revenue sources. And the fact that if we tax food has prevented total tax receipts to state and local governments from declining too much. Nevertheless, there have been declines. And the federal law says that states and local governments cannot spend any of their COVID money to replace that lost revenue to pay for parks and fire and police and uh, mental health and all the other things that state and local government spend money on, which has been um, a bit of a problem. So that second point about that we actually got 11.2 yeah. billion. Here's my, my, my one other That's handout, nice. which I've only got one page. This is from the um, comparison report of the Department of Energy. But the actual, the 1.25 came, there's, there were actually five different federal laws for COVID relief. The big oh. one was the CARES Act. And that's the one that included the creation of this coronavirus relief fund, which mm -hmm. is what Kansas got is 1.2 billion. And, Collie County got 7.4, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's all these other little pieces that went out. And so total grant funding from the federal government for Kansas was $2.75556 million, billion dollars, okay? $2.7 billion. In addition to that, there was something called the Municipal Liquidity Facilitation, which I honestly do not know what that was. $2.7 Small Business Administration direct aid to, um, oh, you know, there's a mistake here. I said 500, 5 billion for agriculture. It's not, it's 5.5 .5 billion went directly to small businesses. Some of, for those, those paycheck, paycheck protection, but it's separate from any of that 1.25 billion mm -hmm. that the state got. Um, 5.5 .5 billion for small businesses, and then about 206 million for, direct aid to farmers. And I, here's the table, it's, I didn't want to, I'm drowning you in boring numbers as is, I didn't want to make it any worse with more detailed. Very, um, very complicated. Very the other thing about the taxes that's interesting and why taxes didn't decline as much as we thought they were, mm -hmm. is that $1,200 mm -hmm. that people got wasn't mm -hmm. subject to taxes, but the $600 of extra unemployment insurance it yeah. is taxable. Yeah. So people are still paying taxes on all their unemployment that. insurance. I don't get that. I know, it's a little weird, isn't it? Um, so here's the deficit that the legislature passed. Um, governor's al uh, allocations. Um, and here, she made the $374 million, which left about $63 million in reductions that the legislature is going to have to deal with in the 21 session when they go back in session. And who knows how they're going to go into session come January. Mm -hmm. you know, they, um, That's a good you know, point. They, if they're going to meet by Zoom, if they're actually going to you know, There's a lot of, um, I know point. a few legislators who have talked about the fact that mm -hmm. the committees have been meeting mm -hmm. this fall. And if they go, they've got an option of being in Zoom or being in the building. And almost everybody who's in these meetings are maskless and not mm -hmm socially distant. It's a kind of really disturbing mm -hmm. kind of situation for them as well. Yeah. Um, and again, I get the largest all allotments were delaying various payments. They also put a moratorium on death and disability benefits for state employees. That if you look at the blue striped mm -hmm. lists, that was one of the wow. things that showed okay. some significant cuts. Um, if Did you finish passing that around? Cause that, that, there's only two copies of that. Everybody see the little stripey handout? Oh, that stripey one there. They're this, they're, they're, there's two of them, and they're pretty much the same. So if you've looked at one of them, you've seen pretty much what you need to see. Okay, so the moratorium on death benefits. So that means somebody's 
a state employee? Is that what you're saying? So I, they've got papers and they're supposed to get so much as a death benefit or what, what is the story? You know, I honestly don't know for sure, but let me see. Well, here's a summary page. Um, capers, it's a capers benefit. So because capers death and disability for the executive branch, they drop about $46.7 million. Um, the judicial branch, they couldn't cut, the allocations can't cut the judicial branch and the legislative branch. They wanted the legislators and the judiciary protected from the executive branch. So the allotments the governor can make only happen in the executive branch, but the benefits, these, the CAPERS benefits are paid out of the state general fund. So, mm -hmm. so um, the judicial branch uh, moratorium cut about $526 million, um, the legislative branch $224 million, um, and... No. So that was one of the other bigger And when you say <clears throat> the adjustments to the human service caseloads, so you mean like people that are that are uh, caseloads like for... Um, well, of course, give for, Kendra one of the blue sheets. For welfare, folks that are on welfare. Yeah. That means they can't take that... Mean, they can't no, add more no, it means they just... It's a, it, a budget is a before the fact allocation of resources mm -hmm. it, and align item to certain items. And in order to do that for the Department of Children and Families, mm -hmm. or to do Medicaid for the Department of Health and Environment, or to do senior services um, through the Department of Disability and Aging Services, so those three departments basically, um, they have to estimate how many people are going to receive the benefits. And it's an estimate. Um, and they were felt able somehow mm -hmm. to reduce those numbers. Again, they don't. It's not actual receipt or actual people that are receiving them. So I honestly mm -hmm. don't know exactly mm -hmm. how they. Put that in. That's what that is. Well, and then what really means is reduction in services. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. what it means. So, so right. in one know. form or another. Yeah, yeah. bottom line we'll is check on children yeah. who might be abused. Well, I'm here to tell you the local, abused. the local yeah. mental health people are really worried mm -hmm. because they, you know, sure. this kind of stuff has really stimulated mm -hmm. need. Yeah. Yeah, and it hits for, them hard all the time. And they're and they're underfunded to begin with. Yes. Well, exactly. it's worse now because yes. kids are home from school. Yes. Parents aren't working, or one of them can't work, mm -hmm. and so you know they don't have as much money. So it's if right. there's any kind of domestic life. abuse or et cetera, oh, exactly. Well, and they, we think we don't know for sure mm -hmm. um, that there is significant increases in the amount of uh, domestic abuse that's oh. taken place. Oh, yeah. But because okay. people are home and not out, and they're oh, not yeah. reporting, um, sure, we don't know. I'd say it's still. I mean, I'm guessing investigations are one of the things oh, that oh, yeah. when we talk yeah. about caseloads and child mm -hmm. welfare, mm -hmm. that's yeah. why. And it's not a, you know, none of this is a good thing to be cutting stuff that's been perceived to be mm -hmm. yeah. important. And Even it's going to be before that, that they were reducing oh, yeah. caseloads. Oh, mm -hmm. the good thing, yeah, it's not. When well, I retired as a social worker in 2008, they were reducing them then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know. Well, there have been serious, serious yeah, questions yeah. about child welfare and working to try to improve mm -hmm. some of this stuff. And yeah. so that was on the list for things to get. Well, and I guess there, I guess you only have so many places where you can reduce, I guess, you know. Well, that's because if you can't cut education. Right. You can't cut education. So you've got, you've got fire, uh, you've got police, you've okay, got local, local government. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess, but on a, on a state level, I guess. State level is prisons. Yes, higher, prisons. Higher, higher education is, is really the, the only really flexible thing in the, in the state general fund right. budget. And right. they have taken big cuts already, oh, yeah. but I think they're going to take significantly bigger ones because there's no place else to cut that's not going to hurt mm -hmm. even worse. I don't know how we possibly cut our prison. Um, oh, I know. We, we could be sending fewer people to prison. I mean, the whole criminal justice yes, that would reform be thing, and some states have been doing that. I don't know that Kansas has been doing it, uh, but, um, but, but the courts, the court, the state pay, pays for the salaries of the district courts, oh. but the counties pay for all the operating expenses and the buildings, buildings and the computer systems that do the scheduling and do all the um, follow-up probations mm -hmm. and all of those things. So um, the courts have been being held back, so if you Hope you didn't really want to get a divorce <laughs> anytime soon, mm -hmm. or re redo a child uh, uh, adoptions, adoptions or, or uh, child support collections. Yes, support collections. Um, 
because those things are all getting pushed Push back. back. Well, and even to legalize drugs. You know, like I know several states have done that. Mm -hmm. well, Kansas is well, one right now. I want to say of only four states mm -hmm. that does not have yeah. either mm -hmm. medical or recreational marijuana use. Oh, yeah. Every yeah. other state has one or both. Right. Uh -huh. And we're yeah. only one of 12 that doesn't have Medicaid. And how yes. many in prison for like so, all you know, drugs? We're really yeah, number one. Or something like that. <laughs> Speak up, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I mean, how many people are in prison for Those, those small minor drugs? drugs. Yep. Yeah, minor drugs. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And that's the one thing that Charles Koch has been very active in, yeah. is actually trying to do criminal justice reform and keep mm -hmm. more people out of prison. It's an interesting uh, mm -hmm. set of policy priorities. Mm -hmm. Take whatever we can get. Well, it would sure help uh, improve the budget if you didn't have to uh, house and, and feed all these and provide health care. And they haven't done anything yeah. other than get caught with marijuana. I mean, really. It, it does or even it cocaine does. or yes, yeah, anything like that. It's still it's a good way. He and actually, there, there's start doing there's a growing, growing consensus that yeah, that, that kind of stuff doesn't help. Probably, the, yeah. the war on drugs has been lost. Oh, it's, it's and we're going to change. We're going to change how we do it so that because um, sending people to jail for these minor drug offenses doesn't do anything to help them. We no. should be doing treatment, we should be doing we should counseling, do we should be doing Help other get stuff. them a job so yeah. they can focus on yeah. something other than yeah. taking drugs. They just had something about this woman, uh, I forget well what state she was even from, but she's on some high class group now and she used to be a heroin addict that was on Smirconish on CNN. Mm -hmm. You know, she said basically sending people to jail for drugs it's is hard. really a dumb idea. Yeah, yeah. But you can't get treatment. Yeah, yeah. And then, well, just to give you an example, now this is a few years old information, so I think it might have changed, but for alcoholism, you know? Yeah, We've exactly. said that all kinds of people to jail, the jail, the yeah. county jails, sure. are the depository mm -hmm. of mentally ill individuals, people sure. that act out, um, who go, who are artistic, or mm -hmm. go to the quick trip and loiter, mm -hmm. get arrested. And kind of where do you take them? Well, in Wichita, you take them either to the St. Joe Emergency Room mm -hmm. or you take them to jail. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, there was no place to do kind of crisis intervention. Sure. And they said they finally, about five years ago, got a crisis stabilization center where they can take these people for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. to, if they're in substance abuse or alcohol or just mental illness crisis, and they get help and they get treatment and they just get stabilized. And then they can figure out longer term to do them. That's one of the things that got cut in the yeah. state, in the, in the mm -hmm. governor's office oh, because yeah. the state, because it just was going to Cedric County, and that's mm -hmm. you know too narrow. But it's going to be a huge problem. And the the time we did the study that created that uh, that center, there were in all of Sedgwick County twelve detox beds. Oh, is that all? Yeah, it's a problem. Um, it's, you know, it's so, many, you know, yeah. and what's a family going to do? You know, people, the, the terrible yeah, they're act, substance abuse. They're thing. acting out. And yeah, <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's, so it's really been an <coughs> underfunded and difficult situation. And I don't want to say defund anything these days because it's too bottom. Yeah, that's it's not a good taken, word. Taken away from the mm -hmm. yeah, prisons. I don't even like the word defund. I, 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 I like that I, I do think we need to fund these other things. And yes. Right. Yes. It, because, you know, yeah, exactly. Well, I, yeah, I've been fighting that. It's for, more of a reallocation of funds rather than 30, 40 years ago when I lived yes. in Oklahoma. And a lot more yeah. mental health. Yeah. Yeah. Setting the different priorities. Yes. Okay, so um, the revenue estimators met again last Friday, mm -hmm. and they raised the estimates. Things were looking better. Right. Revenue's coming in. And they increased uh, the estimate for the 2020 tax revenue by 463 million. Remember, the remaining whole is only about 60 million. Yeah. That's although good. some more legislative actions required. So that means, if the revenues come in as mm -hmm. predicted, and I'm not 100 percent sure they will, because I don't know, even last Friday, if they anticipated how bad the virus was going to get and how yeah, much additional good, shutdown might point. be required. Mm -hmm. um, that means that there's not going to be the need for many big major budget cuts again for FY21. But building the 2022 budget is going to be a problem. Uh, yeah. the, it's, the estimate right now is $166 million less than the November estimate. Um, 
That should say 20, 20, 20, what? No, that's right. Okay. Let's see. First estimate for FY22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. estimate. Right. We're estimating FY22. 2022. 2022. And it's less. So we still think there's going to be less revenue next year going forward than there is because of just slow growth and mm -hmm. continued well, balance. So, so much will be revealed as we go into these right. next several months and through winter, maybe. Well, see, I keep thinking that could be a bad time. I keep for thinking of Game state. of Thrones because I'm going to say winter is coming. Yes, you know, it really yes. is, uh, <laughs> and it's going to be bad. We know it's going to be bad. Yeah, uh, but so looking forward. Um, and there was no carryover either. There's not going to be any carryover at the end of this year. Right. So it's going to be a oh yeah. It's going to be a difficult, difficult budget for the legislature. Mm -hmm. The governor will propose her budget in January. Mm -hmm. The legislature, however they're going to meet, are going to have to figure out a way to deal with it. So, looking forward, the virus is surging statewide and nationwide. Mm -hmm. Hospitals are nearing, or in many cases, have exceeded their capacity. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, there's still almost 90,000 Kansans that remain unemployed, plus probably several thousand others that, yeah. like, and whether they're, and, so, and, and many of those who are employed may be employed only part time when mm -hmm. they would prefer to be employed full time. Yeah. Um, so winter is going to create new challenges. Okay, here you go. Here's where we are. Oh wow. Hmm. This is from if you haven't looked at the governor's office is doing a really good job of transparency in reporting on COVID information and on the allocation of that $1.25 billion. That's why I've got kind of detail on Cowley County in my pile of papers here. Um, and they, you know, update. Uh, this was Tuesday, so it's mm -hmm. updated a little bit. And I'm guessing that flattening out of total cases has probably stopped flattening at this very tip after November 1st mm -hmm. and it's probably going back up again. Mm -hmm. The lights are new new cases and the number of new cases we know mm -hmm. are, are going up. Um, so that's the reality today as we look forward. I mean can't and this are these are Tuesday numbers. These have been updated and I didn't have the full number but statewide um, on Tuesday there were 103,553 cases. It's like 115 thousand plus as oh, of yesterday. Wow. wow. At that time on Tuesday, 4,000 hospitalizations, 1,181 deaths, and I think that's up to like 1,300 or 1,200 jump deaths. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why negative tests are relevant, but <laughs> they report that anyway. And Cali County as of Tuesday had 793 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. active cases. A lot of those active cases are clusters of nursing homes. You know, and, that and that's probably why the death rate is going up so much. Right, because they're older and frailer individuals. Mm -hmm. I think that's true statewide, nationwide. We, we know yeah, a lot of clusters. A lot of clusters. It's not a good time to be a nursing home mm -hmm. patient mm -hmm. at all. No. The other places that we're seeing lots of clusters right now are in high schools and sports teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter works for, for an AmeriCorps program in the Derby Public Schools, and they have like 80 cases mm -hmm. in Derby High School. Yeah. Um, they their football team was all infected and canceled mm -hmm. a couple of games. Um, and that's happening. Mays High School has so many cases. So the Wichita Public Schools, let me see if I... Well, we closed our high school and middle school and right. all of the schools now, but that they started with the middle school and high school. Several yeah, days ago. exactly. It's because it's, they had a lot of kids. Well, that's, it, Wichita and originally staff, it closed. Was the, the staff and it was Ill. staff that were ill. Yeah, yeah but that's the trouble. If the staff gets sick, and there aren't any substitute teachers out there to bring in Not when enough. the teachers yeah. get sick. Yeah. Well, and many yeah. of them have never had to deal with online education, and well, they're burning as we go on how to deal that with the be. technology. My granddaughter is 14 years old, and she comes over to my house every Tuesday and Thursday to do her work as a freshman at North High. And her poor choir, she had a choir teacher mm -hmm. with a 108 choir class with 108 kids mm -hmm. in choir online. And I hear her, you know, she does her scales and then she does it with blowing lips. I don't know how they, <laughs> that's the, these days, instead of going da 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 they go. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's interesting to listen to. But yeah, and then they were supposed to go back. The, the switch to school board has changed their mind like four times. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. four weeks. Well, yeah, you get because of what's going on. You get a neck ache. Yeah. Well, it's hard. It's hard to keep up with all this. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the Kansas numbers. Um, in Wichita, um, they don't have details for the smaller counties, so I couldn't get a lot of detail for Cowley County. But hopefully, Wichita is close enough to mean something. Seventeen thousand cases, wow. one hundred seventy-eight hospitalizations. There's two hundred. 
plus beds, ICU beds in the hospitals in Wichita, 80 of them are filled with COVID, which is a, more than they do. I mean, the ICU still get people with bad accidents and heart mm -hmm. attacks mm -hmm. and heart attacks. surgeries and surgeries. Yeah. 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 lots of them this time. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, um, but they are at capacity. The positive test rate as of this week was over 23%. Mm -hmm. wow. And it's really hard if you don't have symptoms to get a test in Central County. Oh, yes. about here. You, oh, yes. you have to report some. So and especially in Cali, I don't know how many times I've been. Uh, last spring, I was sick, but they never tested me. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of times. That, and the testing equipment's getting better, but it's still mm -hmm. not perfect. As I say, 259 has reversed itself on middle and high school students. Mm -hmm. And they're even thinking that they're going to may have to uh, do something with the elementary schools because the kids are there and they're doing pretty well but the teachers are getting sick mm -hmm. and if yeah. even if these kids get it they don't get any symptoms but they can still carry symptoms home right. to parents and grandparents but then, then and if other teachers that have been in contact with them have to quarantine mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i mean that's i have a friend who's in that now she teaches voice um, music in arc city and she had to stay home mm -hmm. so yeah. now we can just brainstorm about what we think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. like, what do we expect in the coming months? And my mm -hmm. answer is uncertainty. We just well, don't nothing really good. know. I don't think anything uh, possible. Well, no, I, I don't think that's true. I think we're well, going to hear the bottom. The good news is that we are going to get a virus, I mean a vaccine, and it looks like it's going to come sooner than we had originally thought it would come. Now, available to the general public very mm -hmm. earliest will be late next spring, mm -hmm. probably. But it's possible that healthcare workers yeah, the front line. You know, and maybe even some teachers mm -hmm. and people in the nursing homes mm -hmm. may be able to get it by yeah, they March might. or April. They well, really should be put The bad a thing about priority. that vaccine, it's a two dose about and you gotta three weeks apart, really and you have to keep it like at about so minus 70 cold. or something degrees yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's just really cold. So yeah. why uh, they thought that a, dump, that a two dose, maybe they couldn't make manufacture it as a one dose. I don't know, but that's that will be logistically uh, impossible it's going to be really really difficult impossible to right. try to figure that out yep we'll have to get some freezer train cars well they were talking yeah they talked about some kind of special ice chest that they use with dry ice that was another thing on smirconish today where it goes has to have the store. Mm -hmm. well yeah i mean yeah. to me it's, you do smaller amounts of it then it's just yeah. And so, not only that, but about 40% of the population probably isn't going to be interested or more in taking it. Yeah, it's well, going to take a while to build that. And like Cali, I mean, they're going to have to be just a certain place you have it instead of right. every right. pharmacy isn't going to be able to have it. Exactly. Oh, no. No, you'll have and they're to working go. They are actually, I heard they're you'll have working. to go like to the fairgrounds and do a drive. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Something that's like what that. they should do. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're, you know, and that's again, we're getting ahead of ourselves because we don't know for sure when or yeah. how. But I and do it think. It's a different virus. I mean, there's a different vaccine. Different you know, vaccine maybe. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. one's the one that's first and most likely, mm -hmm. but they know yeah. that they're working yeah. on several others. Mm -hmm. As, you, know, the, you know, I don't know most of you have taken the shingles, the new shingle shot, the shingles. You have to take two doses of that. Yes, yeah. you do. Yeah. You know, a couple yeah. months I haven't apart. taken the new one. I think the old one. Do you all remember polio? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. As a kid, I looked up my old records my mom had sent me. Yeah. I think there were five different doses. Oh, oh, yeah, really? you had to take lots of them. And I was young. I'm old enough that I had to get a shot. Now they need sugar yeah. shots or something. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, anyway, what are we uncertain about? And you guys can add to this list. Feel free to pop in. Mm -hmm. But how many workers mm -hmm. are going to remain unemployed? Mm -hmm. We That's don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a um, how many affected businesses will recover? Yeah. Now, I tried to look up on the Secretary of State's website the number of um, businesses that closed that reported in... 2019 that haven't reported in 2020 and it's a huge huge number mm -hmm. but when I try to compare historically it looks like it's always a pretty huge number I mean yeah. small building so little bitty organizations right, start and right, right. last six months and right. never report again so mm -hmm. sure. it's hard to tell we know businesses have closed and we know that mm -hmm. many of them will not reopen but how many I haven't seen but then that's a source of uncertainty too and that's people's livelihoods associated with that. It's unclear if the public's going to become more serious about masking and social distancing, which is really essential to containing the drugs. What we know, what we've known all along, and yet continue, too many of us continue to resist, is that we're not going to contain the economy and recover from the economy until we contain the virus. That's yes. very obvious, it's very clear, 
but too many people just say, open up, open up, and we'll take our chances, and all that's doing is creating mm -hmm. enormous mm -hmm. and unmeetable demands on our healthcare system. And, uh, so, um, and it's unclear if there's gonna be any more federal assistance, and if so, how much. Right. It's very clear to me that the reason the economy has not declined worse is that Federal CARES Act has made an enormous beneficial difference in individual people's lives. It's helped people with unemployment insurance. It's helped them with direct cash subsidies. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to come out with another, I don't know if it's $1,200, but a dollar amount for households below. There was you know, something came out that said it's also going to be able to use that for deduction even if we don't count for, ta for uh, charities. Oh. It, 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 that came out, that there, we're going to be able to, it, even if we item, don't item, uh, okay. don't, don't itemize our deductions, we're going to be able to do like charities to get through that care act. Okay. And well, I think that's a good positive for me because I kept giving, but I, I really enjoyed getting, I mean, yeah. <laughs> get your tax deduction, that tax deduction on that. <laughs> one of these guys, uh, Osterholm or something, he's one of uh, Biden's um, uh, team having to do with the pandemic. I think he's out of maybe the University of Wisconsin, I'm not sure. David Osterholm, I think. And he uh, he's a proponent of people that have it paying them to stay home because the people are out and about doing their thing, mm -hmm. you know. If, well, in one state, the governor told nurses if you have no symptoms but you've got it. That's North Dakota, they said that governor told Yes, them. that you can work in the hospital. So, I mean, that just goes to show you. And you're you, positive for COVID? Yeah, you're yes. positive yeah. test as long as you have no symptoms. <laughs> okay. Well, but uh, that just goes to show you how desperate they yeah, exactly. are. Exactly. They're just absolutely desperate yeah. for people to care for the folks that, that are, do have symptoms and they're hospitalized. Symptoms. Well, I have a nurse friend in Kansas City. She works in OB, stays with her mother, elderly. So, the mom had an aunt or, some, or a, a sister or something that came to see her. Okay, the mom's 90, she got it. Of course, my, my nurse friend got it, and she's got uh, four other sisters. They all got it, a husband and one of them, and her two brothers. So the whole nine of them, or 10 of them, now nobody had huge symptoms, but they were all positive. So that just goes to show you that, you know. Yeah, yeah it's contagious pretty contagious. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. It yeah. spreads very easily. Yeah, but that in, you're right, in North Dakota. Yeah. And they have zero beds left now, yeah. as of yesterday. Well, I know they're not, then they have no place to send them because no. everything else is full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really it's really mm -hmm. daunting and, and dangerous right now. Um, the good news, they said, is the vaccine. The other thing we really don't know is what impact it's going to have on local government okay, mm -hmm. and state government. One of the things about the rhetoric around the CARES Act and then this new, try to get new legislation is, we're not going to support these irresponsible state and local governments that haven't handled their finances yeah. well and we're not going <laughs> to bail them out. And it's like, they're the ones that are paying for the health care providers, the public health. Oh, they're the ones that are paying for mental health. Oh, yes. They're the ones that are paying for schools. And yes. if you want to start with states that have been badly financially managed, <laughs> Kansas needs to go near the top. The yeah. Governor Kelly's been doing a great job for less than two years, though. Yes. And, um, you know, so... But it was right without the health of the yeah, some great they have odds. Had she hasn't had yeah. a whole lot of help. No, no, she has not had much help at all. Right. So anyway, that's where we are. Um, there's lots more detail out there that I just... If you're interested, um, the governor's website, and I, I put it in the thing, but I think it's covid.kansas.gov. Mm -hmm. They've got maps. So here's what... Here's what the Cowley, this is two pages of a big page, but this is what they tell you about Cowley County and how many, um, how many cases they've got, what the population is, and how many, uh, how much money they've got, and then how the money's been allocated. Very little mm -hmm. of it has actually been allocated by the time this was posted, but it tells you mm -hmm. how they're dividing it up between the school districts and hospitals. Mm -hmm. and, and they have a deadline, stuff. too, as to how they have to they quickly, have to their plans. they have to right. get, yeah, get, get, get divvied get up pretty, and get out pretty quick. Get all the applications so, and, and there's one of those, for, there's a map and you can click on any county and oh. get that information. Mm -hmm. The graphs are there and updated mm -hmm. yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah, um, her committee, this, the allocating that one point, well, minus Johnson and Sedgwick counties, their 1.3 million or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, billion, billion. Um, They've been very transparent about the process that they're using and the formulas they're using mm -hmm. to hand out 
uh, that stuff. So um, that, that data is out there. The budget data, the Kansas Department of the Budget has all the governor's allocations. That's where those blue striped mm -hmm. handouts came from. Um, if you go to the Kansas Division of the Budget, on their first page, they'll have governor's budget, and then it's got links to the memo and the allocation tables are all right there at the very beginning of that. Legislative research produces all of the revenue estimate numbers and summarizes the economic assumptions. So they're there and it's available. Um, it's going to be hard the next few years. I think it's going to be hard everywhere mm -hmm. nationally. Mm -hmm. But Kansas, we're going to have trouble. I don't know how she's going to protect K-12 through education without some... I know, that's going to be a challenge. Some cuts. Mm -hmm. um, higher ed is going to take huge cuts, which is going to be a problem. I mean, mm -hmm. long term, this is me getting completely off topic in some ways. Kansas mm -hmm. has too many universities, and they mm -hmm. have too many community colleges. Mm -hmm. um, a state of Iowa with a similar population has three state universities. Mm -hmm. Kansas has six plus Washburn, which the regions could regulate and can do most of. You know, it doesn't, there's nothing wrong with any of the universities here. Mm -hmm. They do a good job, but at some point the problem is we're funding all of them exactly we're going to pay for all of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we're going to face reality um and you know there's other things that ultimately long term we could address mm -hmm. um we probably cut institutional care for developmental disabilities and mental oh, health that's more than deal. we needed to because we never then funded community mm -hmm. assistance for mental health and developmental disabilities sufficiently and it's really really hard to get into a hospital when somebody's having a severe meltdown and then we give them a strict 30 days and you're done no matter how much time you really need it's very hard to live within and i'm here to tell you that this legislature coming up is going to want more tax cuts they passed an additional tax oh, cut they last will. session they will. and the governor vetoed it and by one vote fail to override mm -hmm. yeah. that veto. Um, they're going to yeah. try that again, which is just going to make things more troublesome. Now, and especially the federal tax cut that happened two years ago mm -hmm. was just a fee. I'm an economist, so I'm speaking as my it's economist. It's a fiasco. You don't cut taxes when you're at full employment to say you're going to stimulate the economy. You cut taxes to make people richer, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And it's been, you know, horrific. So the sure. federal deficit is over like a trillion, two trillion dollars before COVID mm -hmm. popped in. Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about those kind of things too. And that means some of us need to make some sacrifices. You know, we can't do this and help the people who really need help if those of us who are really comfortable and well off don't have to give a little bit as well. And we'll see where we go with this. It's gonna, I think it's gonna be a difficult few years. Huh? Well, let's give Nancy yeah. a, a big yeah. round of applause. Thank you so much. Well, I hope it was. I mean, it's, those numbers can be pretty boring and daunting. But well, there's just a lot to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Tremendous amount.